came back, we'd be paying players <laughs> that they could transfer essentially yeah. not once now, but possibly twice. Yeah. I would have said, yeah, right. There's no chance, but it's real. It's crazy. We're going to look back at this 10 years from now and be like, Nuts. did we really do that? <laughs> I mean, crazy. are you kidding me? I started off as a division three coach at Worcester Polytech. So a lot of guys like us have caught a break. And I'd be arrogant to tell you it's because I'm the smartest guy in the world. No, like I, I caught good breaks from good people. I had a chance to be a graduate assistant at Pitt. We had a pretty good player there named Darrell Rivas. I thought I really knew how to coach corners. I found out I had a lot of work to do when he left. At 24 years old, he hired me to be the DB coach. You want to talk about a break? Everything is changed. I was in the NFL. I was working for the Niners. And I had a chance to leave. At the time, a lot of people thought I was crazy, but mm. I miss college football. I miss the relationships. I miss the development of those young players and getting a guy from his freshman year and getting to know him and really develop him, get him his degree, and then have that lifelong relationship. When it comes to the future at Boston College, what do you think is the one or two things that still need to happen to get to the playoff? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, What's up, everyone? Welcome into the Next Up Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Brenneman. Uh, we got a cool episode today. Back to the head coaching interviews uh, in college football. This time I went to Boston College to talk to Boston College head coach Jeff Halfley. The dude has seen a ton of football. NFL College was the D.C. at Ohio State. Now the head coach at B.C. Got hired about four years ago. He's done a really good job building a culture at B.C. and the ACC of winning and uh, went on a good winning streak last year and has that program headed in the right direction. But we talk about all things about his career, the sacrifice it takes, it takes to be a head coach, the ups and downs of the coaching life, transfer portal, NIL. You guys will really, really enjoy hearing Coach Halfley's story, how he got to where he is today. Feel a little bit of a layer back on a, on a prominent head coach in college football. Appreciate Coach for having us out. He was awesome, awesome to deal with. All started because I just DM'd him on Twitter and said, Coach, you want to come on the pod? And we made it happen. So appreciate Coach for doing it. Before you get to the pod, please subscribe to this podcast. Give us a rating if you're listening on audio. Share it with a friend. Leave us a comment. Follow me in the podcast on social media, me at Adam Brennan in across platforms the podcast that next up with adam and then support our sponsors you'll hear in this show you guys supporting our sponsors purchasing things from them even clicking the link that you'll see in the description of this or going to the url helps me a ton helps us produce this podcast and travel around the country and have one amazing guest so without further ado let's go talk to coach jeff halfley head coach at boston college next up all right, big news. We dropped our merch at Mercury, the college sports company. We have college football tees, college basketball tees, the perfect gift for anyone in your life and perfect for you. I wear them all the time, whether it's on podcasts or it's working out. I love the college football tee. So click on the link in the description or go to shop.teammercury.io. That's shop.teammercury.io and use my code ADAMB15 for 15% off your purchase. Code ADAMB for 15% off your purchase. And guys, you buying our merch supports me, supports our company, and allows me to go around and have the best guests on our podcast. So get some of the best merch you can get in college sports. College football, college basketball. We have tees for our podcast. We have hats. We have sweatshirts. Everything you could possibly want. Shop.teammercury.io. Code Adam B for 15% off your purchase. Coach, I appreciate you doing this. Uh, yeah. coming, came off the road recruiting a little bit to, to, to have us out. So I've, I've been wanting to come to BC for a while. So I appreciate it. Yeah, no, thanks for having me on. Get a, yeah. get a day off the road. Got to... Yeah take my daughters to school and, and now I get to sit here with you. So yeah, so I called you this morning. You were at, you were at breakfast with, with your daughter this morning. That's yeah. Cool. It was donuts with yeah. dad <laughs> for my five year old. You still got time for time for all that. You got to make time for most it. Won't, but yeah. I do. Um, she, she thinks it's father's day. So she kept asking me if I'd be <laughs> home for father's day. So I had it on my schedule. So I, I put a, into our recruiting guy. I need to be here on yeah. this day. Plus I got stuff to do in the office. I haven't yeah. really been here. So I went and we had donuts and she was like the happiest That's girl awesome. in the world. <laughs> But I try to, you know, I mean, you know, because you coach for a little bit. Yeah. I mean, you can do this two ways. You can completely neglect your family and your yeah. kids, or you can, you can do it right. I mean, even during a season, I, I, pick my, I pick my daughters up from school every Thursday, and I take them for ice cream. Yeah. And, yeah, sometimes that means maybe I have to work later that night, but yeah. i got to be around my kids and my wife. Yeah. It's too hard of a job. Thursdays are the best day in the college football coaching world, right? Your game plan is done by about noon. Yeah, Thursday. Days in the barn. Thursday at noon, you should be wrapping it up. You yeah. have an academic meeting. At 1.30, I'm walking out of here and yeah. usually get to go out to dinner with your wife or do something yeah. later that night and see her. And then... Friday, it hits at the game right around the corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've always said if, if you're doing, if you're still game planning Thursday night, you're probably, you probably aren't feeling great about it, right? No, or you're really messed up early <laughs> yeah, in the week. Up. And, and you yeah. put something in new that didn't work and you're saying, oh my gosh, we can't run this. Yeah. Um, I was telling you, this is the first time I've been back to BC since I was here. I got uh, my first ever scholarship offer was in your lobby out there. So it's cool to, uh, cool to be back and see the things that have kind of changed. I, I want to ask you about, 
when you got this job, you know, now, was it four, four years ago now? Yeah, four years four, ago. Four years ago. be year five. Yeah, when you got this job four years ago and, and today, what do you think's changed the most during, during yeah. that time? There's a lot has changed, right? <laughs> Everything has changed. Yeah. Um, you know, we were talking earlier. I mean, just, I, I was in the NFL. I was working for the Niners. We were on the mm-hmm. verge of, you know, Kyle was doing a great job out there. And suddenly I had a chance to leave and go be the coordinator at Ohio State. And at the time, a lot of people thought I was crazy, but mm-hmm. I miss college football. I miss the relationships. I miss the development of those young players and, and getting a guy from his freshman year and getting yeah. to know him and really develop him, get him his degree and then have that lifelong relationship. So so we decided to make the move, had success, got the job here. And then as soon as I get here, COVID hits, so that makes it harder, Crazy, right? So yeah. I get to know the team on Zoom. <laughs> and then, then NIL hits and the transfer portal hits. So, yeah. so it all really did change. I feel like every year something new is coming. Even with the portal and NIL, I feel like this was the year where it was even- Even crazy. I mean, it was light years different than even yeah. last year. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it the game has changed so much. Yeah. I think being at BC, um, there's still some of that purity in it yeah. where we have a lot of guys that are doing this because they love football. A yeah. lot of guys that are here because they want to get one of the best degrees in the yeah. country. Yeah. Now, certainly a lot of guys deserve to get paid as well um, mm. if they've earned it and they deserve it and they see yeah. others are. So we need to do a good job doing that. Yeah. But if you had told me when I came back that we'd be paying players, <laughs> that they could transfer essentially yeah. not once now, but possibly twice. Yeah. Um, I, I would have said, yeah, right. There's no chance, yeah. but it's real yeah. and it's crazy. Yeah. And kind of like you said, we're going to look back at this 10 years from now and be like, Nuts. did we really do that? <laughs> I mean, crazy. are you kidding me? The, uh, the, the interesting part is what you just mentioned to me, like thinking about your journey of becoming a first time head coach, uh, and wanting to come back to college football is like you, you did it at the craziest time possible. Uh, and I, I, I want to ask, what is the thing that you feel like when you got the job that maybe you weren't prepared for or that you didn't expect? And I know the obviously NIL, all that stuff. Was, was there anything of the day to day of the job where you were like, man, you don't realize that until you're actually in that in that chair right there? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. I mean, <laughs> looking back now, I was 40 when I took the job. Yeah. And. I don't know. Are you ever really ready? I I don't know if you're ever really ready for anything until you got to dive in and do it yourself. (laughs) Right. And I think each year I've tried to get better. Was I ready? I don't know. I did the best I could. And that's what I'm still trying to do the best I can right Mm -hmm. now and learn each year. The biggest thing I'll say is what hits you in the face is the amount of decisions that you have to make every single day. Mm -hmm. Like when you're an assistant or a coordinator, it's great. You kind of give your input and you kind of say, well, I think we should do this. And Uh you let someone else make the decision (laughs) because it's always easy to give what you think or give advice or suggestions, but the amount of decisions you have to make on a day-to-day basis on stuff that could be six months from now, five months from now today, Mm -hmm. that's the biggest thing. You got to be decisive. Um, The staff's so important. And then the other thing I've learned is not everybody on the staff is going to be do it how you did it and think how you thought it should be done. Mm -hmm. So you got to, You got to educate your staff. You still got to teach your staff. You still got to develop your staff. You still have to make sure you're telling them what your vision is constantly so that they're following your vision. Um, But those are some of the biggest things that I've learned and I'm still learning. Yeah. How tough is the staff part of college football now too? That coach is moving around so much. And when you have success, people want your coaches. When you, everyone, coaches always want more money. I mean, how much of that that is part of the job too? It's a bigger part than you'd ever manage. (laughs) Yeah, coaches come in and just like players, respectfully, they they want to raise or they want another year on their contract. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if they've done a good job, I respect that. And I respect that they're just trying to take care of their families too. Yeah. And that this is a job for them and they put in work. And, you know, sometimes I, they don't understand. I don't, I don't have a pile of NIL money lying around for <laughs> yeah. the players just yeah. to hand them. And I don't have that necessarily yeah. for the staff. Yeah. Um, so those, those are some really hard conversations. Yeah. Um, the hiring and firing piece is, is, is one thing. I didn't yeah. realize how hard that would be. Mm-hmm. I mean, you got to try to, you got to do your due diligence while you hire people and mm-hmm. you got to make your phone calls. You got to interview people and then you got, yeah. you got to make that decision. And then, yeah. you know, unfortunately when you do have to let somebody go, um, you know, that's really hard because not only are you affecting them and their family, and I actually, that's probably hard for me to do with a lot of people, mm-hmm. 
but you have to make the decision that's best for everybody else's family and ultimately yeah. for Boston College. Yeah. Um, and then managing your staff, right? Yeah. It's that's definitely there's a lot that goes into it that being a head coach that you just you would never think yeah. about. And now that I'm also the general manager and you're trying to manage the cap that you yeah. don't really know what the cap is and you're yeah. fundraising and I mean there's a lot of things. I mean, I want to coach football. I know. I mean, I said to you earlier, like I want to coach more defense this year than I did last year. Yeah. And now it's just prioritizing, like, how am I going to not do this? And I, I, I yeah. got to coach again. I miss, yeah. I, mean, I miss coaching DBs. Yeah. But how am I going to do that? Yeah. And that's what I need to figure out. I, I was just talking to someone about I, how an NFL front office is structured and how there's a general manager who's overseeing the roster. And f- there's also someone who oversees free agency. There's someone who oversees the salary cap. That's a separate person, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's all just, just the head coach in college football right now. It's crazy. Like, you're literally doing 10 jobs that would be in the NFL. Yeah, you are, <laughs> which you're, you are, you're, you're trying to manage the cap, which you really don't know what it's going to be. There's, yeah. So you're fundraising for the cap. Yeah. Right. And then you are, you're the GM, you're making all the decisions yeah. on who you're taking, not only in the recruiting class, but now in the portal class. Yeah. And then it's, it's almost like you do it. And a lot of people do, you need, you need someone who's directing the high school aspect, mm-hmm. the portal aspect, yeah. and then keep people underneath there. Yeah. I mean, I even, I kept two coaches back during those two weeks of the portal that I really trusted. And I said, you got your GAs, you got your analysts, you got your recruiting people, you lead the offense, you lead the defense. Cause yeah. I wanted to attack the portal this year yeah. more than I had. That way we had somebody I trusted watching each kid that went in yeah. and then we would meet and then I'd get ready to fly from wherever they told me to go yeah. to go see that kid. Yeah. So now I'm scout too, right? <laughs> now I'm got, trying to go get the kid. I mean, there was one morning I had, and I won't say the exact places. I, I started the morning somewhere in Florida and had breakfast. Mm-hmm. I went somewhere in the Midwest and had lunch. And then I went somewhere completely different and had <laughs> dinner. And I saw three kids. And you're probably finding out where you're going like the day before, right? The or day, or when day. I called back and said, hey, this kid just hit. You got to go see him. And I was like, all right, I'll go. Like, yeah. let's, let's do it. Yeah. And then sometimes there's like a line to see that kid. I flew into one airport. And, and now granted, I'm not, I wasn't flying commercial to these places, yeah. right? But I flew, into I, one small, I flew into one small airport and the lady at the counter said, wow, there must be some really good coaches. There's been like 12 of you here today. I was like, probably don't have a very good chance with this kid. Um, and then you see the planes kind of like the like, I guess we aren't the first here. Someone must have known about this kid before he went in the portal. That's um, but, but that's what you're doing. And the, and the other hard part is you're trying to get to know these kids in two weeks. Yeah. Because here, like, I got to bring in high character kids that value mm-hmm. academics that are going to fit in on our campus and fit in our locker room. That's yeah. really important to me. Yeah. Like, really important. I think we've done a really good job. But you get two weeks to get to know somebody. Yeah. That's it. It's easy to miss when you get two weeks, two right? Two weeks? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean... Because normally yeah. you got two years if you're a high school kid. You're yeah, talking to his counselor. You're talking to his to his high school coach. You know all that. Yeah, you got yeah. years to ask multiple people. But now it's you better do your yeah. homework. Which a lot of times I think for <laughs> us where we've hit is people that we've kind of had relationships with or maybe recruited in the past that get, we did know yeah. or this coach coached them yeah. somewhere else. And yeah. that helps a lot. But I mean, yeah, you can see why you can make some mistakes. I, I respect the, those that have went out in the portal that have got a lot of guys and that hit it and then mm-hmm. have won that way. I mean, you got to give them a lot of credit. Yeah. I mean, they're playing within the rules yeah. and it's hard to hit yeah. on all those players. Yeah. You guys know I love football. And this football season, I've been trying to find a new way to bet on sports. I'm sick of using casinos, the traditional way to do it. And I found the best way to do it, had to tell you guys about it. It's on Cut. Cut is the game-changing social betting platform. Look no further. This is where you got to be. It's a peer-to-peer betting playground. On Cut, you can bet against your friends, bet against fellow fans on sports, politics, pop culture, and much more. It's much much better than just regular sports books. Cut handles payments, so no more chasing friends for money, no more talking to a bookie, hassle-free betting at its finest. And the best part, no more faceless casinos. It's personal and it's exciting. You can customize odds for what you want to bet on. Tailor your bets with fully customizable odds. It's your game in your rules on cut. Also, we get lower VIG on cut. Much lower VIG for a better betting experience for everybody, more winnings and less hassle. One of my favorite parts of cut is the social features. You can dive into group chats, betting leaderboards, head-to-head history and user profiles. It's like having a group of friends on a betting platform and betting against them if you want. Your betting experience just got a major upgrade when you use cut. I didn't even mention that the rewards that you get on the cut app. You get cash back every time you bet against your friends. The more you bet, the more you earn. It is a win-win for everyone. Cut is legal in 40 plus 
plus states, which I love because I'm traveling so much. It's hard to find sports books that are legal in most states. 40 plus states for cut, including those without traditional sports books. So put your money where your mouth is. It's time to fire on sports on the best new app. I've been looking for a long time and I found it. It's on cut. Use my promo code Adam B and get a 10% deposit match at cut.com. That's cut.com. K-U-T-T.com. Use my code Adam B for a 10% deposit match when you deposit money. Again, cut.com. K-U-T-T. Get a 10% deposit match when you use my code Adam B. And guys, supporting our sponsors helps us so much. Helps me personally be able to travel around the country and bring on amazing guests. So go support cut today. You bring up a good point there. I wanted to ask you about how you've decided to build the roster here. Uh, I saw a, 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 um, a quote somewhere you did, you said an article about how you kind of changed your philosophy a little bit of not attacking the portal as hard. And um, one of the biggest balances in college football right now is the need to build for the long term, And you do that by high school guys and building them in your program and developing them. But also you got to win now. Like the, no one's waiting four years anymore, five years until, you know, it's, it's, it's the balance of portal versus high school. How do you view that as a head coach? Yeah, it's hard. I yeah. mean, when I got here, my vision when I took this job before the portal and NIL hit was I wanted to bring in guys and develop them and yeah. hopefully keep them here for the fifth year, yeah. right? So by the time my guys are their fifth year, those fifth year guys are developed. They know the scheme. Mm-hmm. There's culture. Yeah. I believe in the power of the team. Um, so those fifth years are better than some of your you know, your upper echelon, however you want to put yeah. them, they're four or five star freshmen and sophomores. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this year will be the first year where my guys will be seniors. Mm-hmm. So I feel like we've got a good foundation. We've got a good culture. Mm-hmm. Um, I told you in our bowl game, we're losing about three or four players that even played. So yeah. we've kept our players. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's had the shift because while all these other people are adding in this senior and this player and this you're getting you're getting an older league, especially yeah. with COVID seniors. You got True. some guys yeah. playing eight nine years. <laughs> yeah. um, so where I feel like we need competition, or we need players now, or we need depth, I went out and signed nine transfers, and that's that's the most that I brought in. Um, but I I understand it. Things change, and yeah. people would say, "Well, you you said that four years ago." Well, the, yeah, there was no tra- people were didn't trans- exist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think I got to do a better job balancing that, and I have. Um, but ultimately, I still want to recruit and develop. I think that's really, really important for a place yeah. like Boston College. And I think part of the reason our guys are staying too, when they get close to that degree, I think yeah. they're foolish if they it means something by. Here. The yeah. network here is so yeah. powerful that, I mean, you know how hard it is to yeah. play in the league. You yeah. got to stay healthy, right? Yeah. You would have a chance to mm-hmm. continue to play if you were healthy. But such a small percent make it in the league. Mm-hmm. And then these guys will be making a ton of money and have great futures. Yeah. Yeah. When you talk about building culture, you mentioned a couple of times now, what, what goes into that for you? Like, how do you, I guess first, what is your culture you're trying to build? And do you have your kind of principles foundation of it? And then how do you implement that every day? Yeah, everything we do, we talk about being for the team. Yeah. Um, I want smart guys who are tough and reliable. Um, how do you do it? You, you, you try to bring in the right kid, mm-hmm. right? And then hopefully the team kind of, now that we've built this a little bit, I mean, they understand the culture. They've Mm -hmm. lived it. We've been here. And now they're trying to engulf all those young kids that come in. Um, But here it's, it's going to be, I want guys that give everything they have every day to whatever it is they do. You got to go to school here. Yeah. You got to hand in your work here. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we have one of the top graduation rates because our guys go to class, they hand in their work and they show up. Mm -hmm. So for me, my message every day, and it's always been is, You know, if you got a test on Friday and you put in everything you got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and and you know you've done everything, you go into that test and whether you pass it or you don't, I I can live with that. Yeah. Like that's how I approach these guys and everything we do, just like game week. For me as a coach, it's everything I got from the Sunday until Friday. Mm -hmm. And then I go into that game on Saturday, no matter who we're playing with a high level of confidence and not afraid to make a mistake and win or lose. I'm okay. And now I'm not happy if we lose, but we'll fix it and we'll move on. But the culture has got to be where you can't take shortcuts here. That's, that's not what this place is all about. Not in the classroom, not off the field. And certainly not when we're doing it on the field. And if you do that and then you lose shame on you and our kids are starting to see that and believe it, it's going to be the most confident team that we've had. I think the bowl game has helped a lot. I think they needed that for momentum and we're finally getting older. Um, but you, you guys throw around the word love and they can mock me if I say that I love my team and I love my players. But I mean, that's, 
that's why I came back to college football yeah. um, to develop those relationships and do anything I can for these players. And I want them to feel the same way yeah. about their teammates. Uh, I want to dive into your your journey a little bit to get to this point, like your career and, and all the great coaches you've been around. We were just talking before this about, you know, that your time in the NFL and that, that, that Mike McDaniel and, and Ryan and all, all those guys. And then even being around Ryan Day and that, that what's something with those those guys that went on to be head coaches that you learned from a few of those guys? Their work ethic. Yeah. I mean, shoot, in the last staff, I was in San Francisco. Between that and the Browns, it was Robert Salas, the head coach of the Jets. D'Amico Ryan was our linebacker coach. He's the head coach of the Texans. Mike McDaniel was our wide receiver coach. He's the head coach of the Dolphins. Kevin O'Connell was on the staff. He's the head coach of the Vikings. And obviously, Kyle Shanahan. Um, one, they're all, they're really good people. Yeah. They're very intelligent and understand football. But it, it's the work ethic that they've mm -hmm. put in. It's a hard, pro, it's a hard profession. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they grind, they study, they're demanding. Yeah. Um, they have great relationships with their players. They hold people accountable. Mm -hmm. They're not afraid of confrontation. Um, it's been a really good group, and they're all different. I mean, they're all different types of leaders. Some are rah rah guys. Some mm -hmm. are more introverted. Yeah. Some are a little quirky. Yeah. Um, but they're great people, they're great leaders, and they're highly intelligent in their field, and they grind. Yeah. I always feel like people who reach the level of success that you had to be a Power 5 head coach, at some point in your career, you, you catch a break, right? Something goes your way, or, you, or a job opens up that you didn't think. What, what was the break you think you called in your career that, that let, let you get to this point? Yeah, we've all caught breaks because, I mean, I started off as a Division three coach at Worcester Polytech, right? <laughs> So it's good ball, man. That's good. It, it is good ball. <laughs> it's good football. And, the, and those kids are playing because they love it, <laughs> yeah. not because they're getting. My dad played D three football, and he's always like, "There's some good players now." At D3. Yeah, and they love football. They're <laughs> yeah. just not as fast, not yeah. as big, but they're tough mm -hmm. kids who love playing football. Um, so I think, I mean, I've been around great high school coaches, and I've been mm -hmm. around great Division three college coaches. It's just a lot of guys like us have caught a break, like you yeah. said. And I'd be arrogant to tell you it's because that I'm the smartest guy in the world. And no, like I, I caught good breaks from good people. And, you know, I had a chance to be a graduate assistant at Pitt. Um, and I think it was 2006, Paul Rhodes was the coordinator. He's now on our staff. Yeah. It was cool. I got to hire him back. He's yeah. probably one of my biggest mentors. He hired me to be a GA and uh, we had a pretty good player there named Darrell Rivas. <laughs> so I thought I really knew how to coach corners. <laughs> yeah. Just turns out he was really he was good. I, I found out I had a lot of work to do when he left. Yeah. But Paul left and went to Auburn as a defensive coordinator. Coach Wanstead, who is, in my opinion, one of the greatest human beings and greatest coaches I've ever been around, at like 24 years old, he hired me to be the DB coach. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about a break? That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, he took a chance on me, who was a young GA sleeping in my office and mm -hmm. just trying to do everything he could. He called me in and said, hey, we're going to hire you to coach DBs. And I remember calling home and, you know, I was sleeping under my desk, like eating peanut butter out of a jar because you couldn't, <laughs> you know, you couldn't afford <laughs> yeah. anything as a GA. And all of a sudden you're calling your mom and dad and saying, thanks for all your help. And I, I got it, you know, yeah. like that's like, so that was like my first, like, that's my real break or else. And I'm fine. I'm coaching Division three football, thinking life is great. But yeah. that kind of propelled me. And then I got a chance to go to the NFL and stayed in the NFL and hooked on with some really good coaches. Yeah. Um, Ryan Day, one of them. We worked together for one year in San Francisco. And then he called me up out of the blue. I'm sitting and eating hamburger with my wife and kids. And he said, I got the Ohio State job. I was like, yeah, all right, sure you did. <laughs> He's like, no, I'm serious. I was like, dude, you just... You just got there. You're yeah. there. What are you doing? He's like, no, I'm going to be the head coach. I was like, all right, whatever. He's like, I want you to come with me. I was like, I'm not coming. <laughs> um, but then he gave me a break, right? Yeah. I hadn't coordinated before. Gave me a chance to do that. And, and then good players. Yeah. Like, I'd be crazy to tell you that I went to Ohio State and, you know, we took over a defense that wasn't very good. And I just magically, I mean, I've been around good players. I mean, yeah. I coached Revis and Rondé Barber with two Hall of Famers. Rondé yeah. taught me as much about the nickel position as yeah. any coach. And um, and then I, yeah, you get Chase Young and Jeff Akut, and you get great players, and you coach them yeah. up, and you teach them. And, but I've gotten breaks from coaches. I've gotten breaks by coaching great players. I got the opportunity to coach Richard Sherman and mm -hmm. learn more from how to play his own coverage from that guy and just listening to him than I did from any coach. So, yeah. I mean... I've gotten a lot of breaks yeah. and I'm here to tell you that it's not because I'm any better than that guy who is coaching division three football. It's I've worked hard and I pushed doors down, but I've gotten breaks. Yeah.
Yeah. The, the trend, though, is that you've been prepared when the breaks come, right? That's the yeah. big key. You got, you got to work. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the key in anything is yeah. it's a hard profession, and, and we give up a lot. Yeah. I mean, you want to talk about as a young coach, I mean, there was a five-year stretch where, you know, I didn't go out. I probably missed most of my family members' weddings, parties, <laughs> Yeah. And anything you can think of. All my college buddies started to get married and yeah. you don't go to any of those weddings. They, they got a reunion over here and, and you can't because you work on weekends. Mm-hmm. They're so making money in your GA. They're right? making money and, <laughs> and I'm driving a, a Subaru Outback that has 200,000 miles on it that doesn't have air conditioning. Yeah. I can't get the key out of this thing. Like I'm not even joking. At one point, I mean, there, there was one year I was driving home that Subaru Outback from Pittsburgh to New Jersey when I was a GA and I didn't have enough money for tolls. So I'd be stopping at the tolls, honking, pretending to like throw money in the thing, putting my arms up That's and just shooting by. Um, but you look back, it's a sacrifice. You lose some friends, yeah. right? You find out who your real friends are, mm-hmm. but you miss time with family. All oh, nothing's guaranteed. Yeah. But because for me, the way I always said it was, I'm going to give it this amount of time. Mm-hmm. And if I'm not where I need to be, then I get it. I'll go yeah. do something else. But I just wanted to have no regrets. Yeah. And that's like, that's how I coach right now. It's how I live right now. Yeah. Just, I do the best. I know, you know, there's some people that haven't been happy with something. I get it. But at the end of the day, whatever I do, I'm doing everything I can. And I can keep my head high because yeah. I'll fix it if it doesn't work. But I'm doing everything I can. Yeah. Uh, during that, the coaching journey we just talked about, uh, I'm sure you had a bunch of job interviews, right? What's the toughest job interview you, you were on during that time? Oh, that's a good question. Um, Anyone just grill you on the whiteboard for a while? <laughs> I don't know if I've ever gotten really grilled on the whiteboard. The longest interview I ever had was, and a lot of people don't even know this, is when I was I was leaving Tampa and I went to, I had a chance to interview for the Bills. Uh-huh. Um, and that interview was like two days long. <laughs> I mean, I just, I went in there, thought I was prepared. Yeah. I was like 31 years old. And that interview, that was like a two-day deal. Watching film, drawing some stuff on the board. They were calling everybody I knew. (laughs) And I actually got the job. Uh So on my resume, nowhere does it say Bill's DB coach. But I got the job. And then they they said, uh, Coach Marone was the coach at the time. He said, all right, and Mike Pettin. So Mike Pettin was the Uh defensive coordinator. And he said, hey, take two weeks off. Our staff's gone. They're on vacation. So Gina and I went away on vacation. And then in that time, Pet was interviewing for the Browns job. So he calls me. He's like, hey, I might be getting the Browns job. I want you to come with me. I'm like, I just signed my contract in Buffalo. So I was like, well, we can talk to Coach Marone. I was like, so he gets the Browns job. I fly to Buffalo. And there's like a snowstorm going on. I remember getting in the Buffalo office. All the guys I interviewed with on defense were going to Cleveland. Yeah. So I was like, I don't know anybody here. I'm like trying to find Coach's office. I go to Coach Marone. I was like. Coach, what's going on? He's like, well, Pet put in for you. I said, what do you mean put in for it? Well, he wants you to come with him, but you're under contract here. But I understand he interviewed you. He wanted you to be his guy on defense. So it's like, if you want, you can go to Cleveland. And I'm just like, uh, what do I say to the head coach? I said, yeah, I guess I'll go to Cleveland. Yeah. So I didn't even know how to get out of the office. So then I got to get out of the office in Buffalo and try to figure out how to get a ride. And I got a ride to Cleveland. So I show up in Cleveland, call my wife. I pull up in front of the Cleveland office. I say, we're going to Cleveland instead. <laughs> so you, I mean, maybe not the craziest interview, but that's the craziest coach, yeah. two weeks. So wow. then the funny part was, and I get a check like a month later from the bill. Oh, if that was there for two weeks. I had to pay me. I was going to say, you got paid, so paid not for, for the two bills. weeks for the bills. So I technically, I technically coached for the bills. Yeah, I didn't see that on your coaching profile. No one did. Yeah. I forget about that story. But when you asked about interviews, it rang a bell, but I'll never forget. I didn't even know how to get out of the office. And then I had to figure out how to get to Cleveland. <laughs> And then I text my wife and say, hey, forget the houses we were looking at. Yeah. Start looking at Cleveland. How does your wife handle all that? I mean, it's, it's, it's like, it's a lot, right? Being a coach's wife. Yeah, that's another. I mean, you want to do a whole podcast, you should <laughs> do a podcast on some of our wives. I mean, mm-hmm. what they sacrifice and what they give up. Yeah. I mean, there's times when it's like, Gina, I got to go and I get on a plane and life's good for me. I have kind of built in friends. Yeah. Right. Think about that where, all right, hey, you got to with the movers, get the That's house boxed point. up, clean yeah. everything, get the kids, yeah. everyone's going to leave and mm-hmm. show up in a new house in a new city, yeah. make new no friends, friends. Yeah. get school systems, find new doctors, start unpacking the house. Yeah. So forget what I sacrificed, what our wives in this profession have sacrificed. Yeah. I mean, that's like, you need a special woman in your life who can do that or you have zero chance. Yeah. 
So now, I mean, we've been blessed going on year five. I mean, living in the same area, that's a long time in coaching. Yeah. And, um, you know, very fortunate to have that. But you could do a heck of a podcast on what wives go through. Yeah, it's a great I mean, there's, point. There's a lot of, I mean, we have some coaches whose families have lived away from them for four years. I mean, yeah. I just, that's hard. Yeah. It's really hard. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. I mean, you, I should do a podcast on that. Yeah, I mean, you, get <laughs> some, you get some stories of probably yeah. some angry wives. I've seen it all. Some special wives and yeah. some angry wives. Yeah. Today's episode is brought to you by Ekron Athletics. Listen, you guys know I was an injury prone player during my playing career. Felt like I was hurt having surgery every other season. Looking back on it, I wasn't recovering the right way. So now, in my post playing career, I made it a mission to figure out how to recover best. And that's when I found Ekron Athletics. Their B37S percussion massage gun, this thing right here, has changed the way I recover after big workouts. I wish I had this thing when I was playing. It was named the best overall massage gun by GQ, Sports Illustrator, and other trusted publications. I'm telling you, every player and athlete out there should be using this thing to recover after workouts and games and to get loose before games and practices. And even if you're not playing sports and using it before the gym and after the gym, I use it when I'm sitting at home watching college football every Saturday. I mean, this thing is beautiful. I love it. I take it with me everywhere I go, even on the road when I travel. Oh, and the B37S massage gun is not just just about a quick fix. It's got a long battery life and it comes with a lifetime warranty guaranteeing this thing lasts much longer than my football career did. Whether you're a current athlete, a former athlete, or just an everyday person trying to stay in shape, you need to try the B37S percussion gun from Ekron Athletics. Go to EkronAthletics.com today and start recovering faster and moving easier. That's Ekron Athletics and use promo code NEXTUP for 25% off your purchase. That's E-K-R-I-N athletics.com with promo code next up for 25% off your purchase. The, the cool thing though uh, has to be when you get the call from, you, know, you, you want to be a college head coach your whole career. When you get the call from, uh, I forget who the AD was at the Martin, time. You've had first, so many of them now. I've had three. <laughs> yeah. Martin Germain. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, who's now at UCLA. Yeah, right? UCLA. yeah, yeah. Great so, guy. Um, when you get that call that you're one year defensive coordinator and now you're going to be power five head coach, what was the call like when you find out and how, how cool was it to tell everyone that's been with you through that journey? Yeah, that was, I kind of kept it quiet. We, cause it was, it, that was kind of a whirlwind. We were playing, we just won the big 10 championship. You know, they, they wanted to interview me before the big 10 championship game. And, and I said, guys, I, I can't like, I'll meet you. Yeah. We can have a conversation. So we met after the game planning on whatever Wednesday or Thursday in college, mm -hmm. whatever it was. And um, had a really good conversation in the hotel with a bunch of people. And then we went and we won the Big Ten Championship. And literally that night, he called and said, we want to fly in on Thursday. So I'm mm -hmm. like, at that point, I think I went to like the Broyles Award on Monday. I go on the road <laughs> and I'm recruiting, fly in to Boston interview. Mm -hmm. And I was going to see a kid in Arizona. So I flew from Boston to Arizona <laughs> to just to fulfill my job and yeah. make sure we try to get the kid. And then as I landed, they had called and offered me the job. So then I'm sitting in the kid's house, like, and I fly back to have a wife uh, conversation with my wife. Uh, we're going to take the job. But yeah, I'll, I'll never forget where I was in that whole week, how it transpired. And yeah, you're grateful. You start thinking about everybody that's helped you in the past. Um, start calling your family members and telling them. And that, that was very special. Yeah. And it, that's a moment that, you know, again, you kind of got to reflect on all the people who helped you along the way because you, you didn't do it by yourself, right? Yeah. And you can't be arrogant to think that you did. Um, and then your mind immediately goes to, wow, now I got to go tell these kids tomorrow because this is going to break, yeah. right? So I remember on the phone saying, it was like 10 at night, 11 at night, hey, please don't let me tell my players tomorrow, mm -hmm. right? And then all of a sudden, eleven fifteen, your phone starts blinking, and it's all out because yeah. nothing can ever stay no. a secret. And you got agents, you got all. <laughs> yeah. Now you're letting the players, you yeah. know, and then you walk in, and yeah, it was that was a crazy that was a crazy year of my life. I mean, fast. I left the NFL to try to be head coach. It happens within a year. It, everything's been fast. Last five, the last yeah. five years have been crazy. Yeah, the uh, the whirlwind when you get hired too. I mean, we were talking a lot about the whirlwind of coaching, but when you get hired, what what was the first then like two weeks? You're trying to build. I get first time I go trying to build a staff. Uh, you get you call on everybody, and then you got to recruit your own roster, right? You're calling every oh, like the, you didn't the that. portal. You didn't. That's right. No That's right. I don't know so how you, you do it now. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Now I don't, I don't know how you do it now. Where now you better call and. Try yeah. to keep your kids out of the portal. That's why, I mean, you got to be careful. You, you, you move on. You move on from a coach or a coach leaves and your yeah. roster is going to get poached. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be scary. Some of these teams, it's going to take them a while yeah. to get back. 
they might have a good first year, yeah. but now you got to, they could set a place back. Yeah. Um, for me, I got hired, but then we had to play, we were in the playoffs. That's right. So, so I, playoffs, I yeah. fulfilled my obligation. So I was, yeah. we're at Fiesta Bowl. So I was doing all the things at the Fiesta Bowl. And then at night I was trying to get on the phone with the players on the team to get to know them, trying to hire staff. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, that was, that was that was a crazy time. Yeah. And then, yeah, you're meeting everybody here. You're hiring staff. You're interviewing guys. You try to get like your ops guy here to help you out. Yeah. You try to get your coordinators here so then they can yeah. help you interview. Yeah. But that's not easy. Yeah. Right. And then you try to get to know your team. Unfortunately for me, as we were sent home pretty quick, because so I was doing it on the computer because of COVID. Yeah. <laughs> what a whirlwind. That's funny. Uh, the uh, when when you got the job. And you, after you did all that, after you got your staff, what's the one thing that you wanted to change right away? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, obviously schemes are big, yeah. right? Um, I felt the biggest thing for me was at the time talking to the players, I wanted to bring some confidence to them yeah. and I wanted them to enjoy the game. Yeah. And I think everywhere that I've been, you've played it. It's a game. You got to enjoy it. Mm-hmm. You got to enjoy practice. Yeah. You got to play with confidence. I don't want guys playing scared. I didn't want them playing tentative because they were afraid to make mistakes. I didn't yeah. want coaches just like what always bothered me was, you know, DB gets beat on a goal ball and you start yelling and screaming at him. Go, yeah. go coach him. Tell him yeah. why. Ask him what he saw. Yeah. Ask him about his first step. Yeah. Ask him what he did at the top of the route, what the split was, and then tell him what he should do better. Yeah. Um, Cause even when I got to Ohio state, I tried to instill that mentality right away where don't be afraid to make mistakes. That's why you practice. Yeah. Go as hard as you can within the coaching and if you make a mistake, we'll fix it. That's what practice is for. Because yeah. when you get to a game, you, you got to be fearless and you can't be scared of anything. Yeah. And that was the biggest thing I wanted to make sure I, because young kids struggle with that. Mm-hmm. I remember Ohio State with Jordan Fuller, who's now the captain of the Rams, one of the first spring ball practices, he got beat on a post. He was on a middle safety and he bit up on a play action pass. And he kind of looked at me and started staring at me because I was standing back yeah. there. And he thought I was going to, I found this later out. He thought I was going to just start ripping him. <laughs> yeah. And I said to him, I said, hey, what'd you see? Yeah. He's like, I saw this. It's like, oh, don't put your eyes there. Put your eyes here. Yeah. And then you won't see that again. Yeah. Right? You got to protect the post. And I yeah. like, hit him on the back of the helmet. At the end of the year, he told me that was like, he's never felt so relieved and gained <laughs> confidence. And it was like, yeah. and we still joke about that. But that was the biggest thing that I wanted these guys to feel for me early on. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to ask you a, a ball question. Uh, I try to stay away from these because no, most, most people, most people that watch the podcast won't, won't know what we're talking about. But uh, as a, a, you've seen a ton of defense. What, what's a, a trend on each side of the ball that you're seeing in college football right now um, that is kind of becoming more and more prevalent around the game? Yeah, I think you're seeing a lot of teams go to three down. Yeah. I mean, you know, three down linemen get more people on their feet, yeah. um, which. You know, I get people are spreading the ball out, the quarterback run game. There's a lot more simulated pressures now where yeah. it looks like you're pressuring, but you're only sending four yeah. and you're dropping into coverage. The trend a couple years ago is that extra safety in the middle of the field. Say, three safety, yeah. Iowa State stuff. Right, which, yeah. which got yeah. hot. So you, you do try to stay up with the trends. Yeah. Um, I have a pretty solid core of what I believe in, but I also mm-hmm. think you need to continue to adapt and to grow. Mm-hmm. Um And I think that's really important. And I wish I had more time with that. I mean, part of the cool thing about the NFL is you could come in the off season and say, I want to study the top red zone team on defense and on Monday. And then Wednesday, I want to study the top third down team. And on Friday, I want to study. It's hard enough to watch film of your own cutups in college football, (laughs) everything that you got to do. But I still try to watch a lot of NFL tape to stay updated with what the trends are in that league too. Um, and you can see like everyone was running the, the Seattle defense and there's still a lot of teams doing that. And now coach Fangio's defense, it's that yeah. whole cult of people are doing yeah. that. So those yeah. are fun things still to study. What, you mentioned your, uh, you know, kind of what you believe in on defense. What, what is that? If someone says, what is the coach Halfley defense? What, how do you describe it? We've been more middle closed defense with a safety in the middle of the field than probably most people in college football. Yeah. Um, most people are some type of too high quarter space and I get it for the quarterback run game. So mm-hmm. we've had to kind of trend in that direction as well. But I've, I've done a lot. I've done a lot, at least a starting point with the middle close with four down linemen. Um, very similar. To what we did in San Francisco and Ohio state and a lot of people are doing in the NFL. 
Um, but I've started to adapt and create different one high shells, which really play like two high shells and get extra guys in the box. Yeah. You just got to stop the quarterback run game. So it's yeah. a different, it's almost when I talk to my friends in the NFL and we talk defense together, it's almost a different game. Yeah. I mean, cause the quarterback in the NFL, they're going to run it in big moments or in the red zone or on third down yeah. or in a championship game. Right. Mm-hmm. But you can't do that week in and week out. Yeah. And you got to account for an extra guy. Yeah. So you got to change. Yeah. Um, and those are, and then you can go, I, I joke sometimes unbalanced. It's, you can't do that in the NFL. It's like yeah. we're defending unbalanced formations. There's a field and a boundary yeah. in college football where in the NFL, the ball's in the middle of the field the whole game. Yeah. It's a different game. Yeah. Um, and it's been fun to, to follow it. Yeah. Uh, well, you mentioned that you mentioned the hash marks. What, what's, What's something that, uh, what's a rule that if you could change it in college football, you would? Other than, I mean, everyone, when I ask this question, everyone says the NIL stuff. Yeah. So uh, an actual like gameplay rule. I'd probably go to the NFL hashes yeah. and go more to the NFL rules. I'd put the, I'd put the quarterback, the mic in his helmet. Yeah, that's got to happen. Right? Help us <laughs> not steal signals, right? Yeah. And, and again, if, if you're going to signal, then yeah, I got it. During the game, steal signals. Yeah. I get it. No problem. Hide your signals better, right? <laughs> Um, but I would do that. We've kind of went to the, the clock, right? It's yeah, running first, yeah. until I'd add in the two minute warning, just like yeah. the NFL, um, you know, situational football is huge. So I think, you know, playing the game this way, makes you think a little bit more, but why not make the field dimensions the same? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and then get rid of the unbalanced so we don't have to defend unbalanced <laughs> formations. Yeah. You got your unbalanced check, right? Every, yeah, you got, you got to work on every yeah, week, your every unbalanced week. check. Yeah. And I mean, the offenses are good at it yeah. and it's hard to defend. Yeah. So you get the nub tight end on oh, the, yeah. at the tackle spot. And the guy's got to recognize it on the field. You get X off the line of scrimmage. Yeah. The corners rarely see that the X is off. Then yeah. that guy motions over. You're and, screaming it from the sideline. Yeah, no you. <laughs> you see it from the booth. That's all yeah. who sees it. Everyone's yeah. yelling. Um, you know, there, there's some other things and rule changes that I think little things here or there, but we might as well make it as close to that game as we yeah. can. I think we'll prepare them even better for it. No, that's a good and point. it's time tested, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask about when you're evaluating prospects and players, and I think it's really prevalent on the defensive side of the ball because a lot of defensive positions are projections from guys you see in high school, or you have a guy who plays D end who's going to be an interior line, a defense lineman, or a guy who plays corner is going to play safety. Um, how do you balance when you're evaluating, play, evaluating players the difference or the the gap between the guy who the corner who's long and rangy and can run but doesn't play very good on film versus the guy who's maybe five ten, uh, not as long, not as athletic, but great in coverage, great on film. Like that balance of when you take the risk and when you take the safe guy who's got great character, and it's because you got to get both at some point, right? Yeah, you do, and that's you know the six foot three corner like you mentioned. If he was a twitched up guy yeah. and he could do all that stuff, yeah. then he's going, he's going to Georgia. He, yeah. and he's going yeah. to Georgia or wherever. Yeah. Whatever, yeah. wherever he chooses to go. Yeah. Um, it's funny. I watched the, I was in high school yesterday and I watched the six foot three corner and coach put on his film. And I was like, who's your DB coach? Mm-hmm. I was like, he's, this kid's got great fundamentals technique. I mean, I was like, this kid's really good. I was like, what's he got going on? He's like, he's got like Ivy leagues and it's like, all right, he's a good student too. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I got to get, I need to see this kid live. Right. I think that's the next step yeah. with those guys. Cause mm-hmm. the question is, is he fast enough? Well, six, three, if you have length, you don't need to be four, four because yeah. your length will make up yeah. for your speed. Right. Yeah. Smaller guys got to be faster yeah. because bigger guys have more length. Um, so for me, the next step in a situation like that is to get him to camp. Yeah. I mean, I've got a lot of stories of you see a guy live in person, you see how competitive they are in practice mm-hmm. and you take that kid because you got your eyes on him. Yeah. And I think that helps a lot seeing the kid live. The kid who's a little too small or maybe, but is a great player. You got to have great football players. Yeah. And that's what I've learned. You can't just take a roster full of projections yeah. because then there's a good chance you're not going to end up with enough good football players. Yeah. You gotta have good football players who have instincts that are tough and that love it. Yeah. That's what works here. Yeah. And you get enough of those guys, you're gonna win games. Yeah. And they're versatile. You can move them positions if you That's have right. to. Yeah. yeah, but but trying to find guys for us, like Donovan is Raku, who, you know, he led the sacks in the ACC a year ago. He was an undersized two hundred and five pound defensive end that mm-hmm. now he's two fifty five and it took him time to develop, but we have to hit on those guys too. Yeah. Yeah. Where, you know, maybe whatever school says he's not a finished product. Well, we got to be able to develop that guy. Yeah. Now the hard part is 
Now we got to be able to keep them yeah. after we develop them. <laughs> yeah. But so that's the you other find thing. the under the underrated guy. You may lose. <laughs> that's the problem now, yeah. right? You, yeah. you develop the underrated kid, yeah. and then all of a sudden he's in my office, which has happened, saying, "Hey, I just I got these calls, and I got offered this money to go here." I'm like, yeah. "You're kidding me!" Yeah. Like I had with Zay Flowers and some yeah. other guys we've had. Yeah. Well, how do you go about as a head coach then? working on keeping your current staff. You told me, or I'm sorry, current players. You told me a little bit about how you just spend time hanging out with the players in your office, right? I think it's relationships. Yeah. Um, it's them knowing that you can develop them. It's them seeing that in the last few years, we've had two first round picks, so mm -hmm. you can do it here. Yeah. It's them, it's getting the culture where, yeah, it's players that love players, players that love coaches and coaches that love players. Yeah. I think that's really important to have the connection. Yeah. I can't, I set the office up like this. So guys would come and feel free to, I don't want to be the principal. Like they have to be able to come in yeah. and have conversations with me because things are hard. Yeah. And you know, they're going to have bad days. They're yeah. going to have days where they might want to leave. They're going to have days where maybe they don't think they're good enough. They're going to have days where maybe they think they're the man. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you go through all those emotions. Every one of us did at some yeah. point in college but they got to feel like, you know, I've got their back yeah. and that I'm here for this team. And then the beauty of Boston college is the closer they get to that degree, mm -hmm. it's, that's a, that's a bad lifelong decision if they leave here yeah. because this network and this degree will change their life forever. Yeah. And I think they understand that. Yeah. Uh, we, we've talked a little bit uh, about NIL and the portal and how it's impacting college football. The one thing that everyone's going to want to hear us talk about is that and what, what you're actually seeing out there, what go, you know, you see everything on the, on Twitter and the news and reports of what, like, what do you actually see on the ground of what's really going on behind the scenes with NIL and the portal and tampering and players leaving. Uh, and then after that, we can get into how, what is the solution to actually fix it? I don't know what the solution is. <laughs> I, I don't. Someone's going to get paid a lot of money to come up with that. Solution. I just, yeah. I mean, we talk, I, I just don't see it going away. Yeah. I mean, Everyone's coming up with, I mean, you could talk about solutions right now of conferences. You could talk about yeah. everything seems to need a solution right now. Um, yeah. we, we just need more rules, right? What am I seeing? I'm seeing everything that you just talked about. Yeah. Players are getting paid a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, tampering is going on. Um, and then there's those that are following whatever rules that are there to the best that they can. Yeah. Um, but everything is happening. And yeah. I don't think the intent was, I, I'm all for, I'm all for players getting paid. I am. I, I, I think mm -hmm. it's great. Right. That with the portal together is a complete disaster, which I think everybody has mm -hmm. said. Um, but there just needs to be rules and there needs to be, I mean, look at the NFL, everybody, you got a salary cap, you can use X amount of money. Um, and there's some parity there that, yeah. that, that, that league was built, right. You, you, you're the last place team. You get the first round pick. Yeah. So they want it to be a competitive yeah. league yeah. and everything is built in the NFL to be a competitive league. Now, usually the team with the quarterback, they end up yeah. in the final four and mm -hmm. the Super Bowl winner usually has a good one. So I get all that, but it is built to kind of keep yeah. it balanced. Right. I just, we're going down a road where there's going to be more imbalance than ever. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. Yeah. You, you're getting some teams that can really, really pull away. Yeah. And then you're getting some teams that you've seen over the last few years have had a lot of success and you're going to start to see them fall off. And it's yeah. not, not because of lack of coaching and it's not because of a lack of effort, but it's because what others are doing, it's just, you're yeah. not on the same playing field. You're not yeah. playing in the same sandbox as some of those other teams. Yeah. And that's the part that that's hard. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Cause yeah. you're, you're playing the same game. You're playing the game with the same ball. The rules are the same on the field. Yeah. But off the field, it's just different. Yeah. You know, and yeah. that's, that's what you hope eventually. People are always going to have an advantage. I got it. Yeah. I, 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 I totally get it. And I respect that. But if you're going to have some teams with a $12 million salary cap <laughs> and some teams with a $1 million salary cap, it's hard to play money ball in football. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta, yeah. that's hard. The, the good news is you got a great quarterback. <laughs> that helps things, right? <laughs> that so helps tell, things a lot. Tell, what, what was the moment you knew Tommy was going to be special? Yeah. I mean, it, it was, we had a guy who I have a ton of respect for and Emmett Moorhead. And I yeah. thought, I mean, the guy, we beat NC state with him and knocked off the 16 team in the country after struggling a year ago. Yeah. And we kind of built the offense around him and didn't feel like we had a backup. Um, so we went out and, and we got Tommy and, 
you know, I was very honest. I said, you're going to have a chance. We're going to, everybody competes, go out and compete. Mm -hmm. And we started in uh, camp. You start seeing him run around, run around and do some things he was doing. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. we, we got, we got something here. Mm -hmm. And then he's only here. He didn't get here mid-year. He got yeah. here in like May or June. Yeah, so he's, yeah. we don't even know who he is and yeah. he doesn't even know the system. And then all of a sudden he keeps getting better and better. Yeah. And we put him in, in the first game and he made a couple of plays where he ran backwards. I was like, where's he going? Where's he going? And then he <laughs> made some plays. Yeah. So he started to think, all right, he's got it. Yeah. Uh, I think it was the Florida state game. Um, yeah. Florida state game. I mean, you know, we missed an extra point or we're tied. Mm -hmm. Um, he did some stuff in that game where in my opinion, he looked like one of the top players on the field. Yeah. He might outplay Travis that game who, I'm not saying Travis, I think is a star. And yeah. if he stays healthy, maybe wins a national championship and Heisman. And, but Thomas looked like the guy on that field. Yeah. And then we started getting the offense built around him. And that's when I thought we had something special. And then what he did in the bowl game when he was healthy again, yeah. he took it over. Um, yeah. And now what you're seeing, and as I haven't been here much, but talk to him all the time and talk to the mm -hmm. players, the confidence and the leadership. Yeah. He's going to take a step now because imagine you're playing the whole year and you're just trying to figure it out. I mean, he's yeah. in more survival mode than anything else. Yeah. Now he's going to have an off season yeah. and then he's going to really understand the scheme that we're going to really build around him. Yeah. He's got a chance to be special. Yeah. He's been awesome. And yeah. um, we're very grateful to have him. Yeah. Um, when it comes to the future at Boston College, what do you think is the one or two things that still need to happen? Um, whether it's culture, whether it's, administratively or anything uh to get to uh the the goal which i'm sure is a conference championship and and you know playoff yeah we now we got the biggest thing for us is we gotta we gotta continue to invest yeah right and um as things evolve and things change you know it's blake james has been here now for i guess a year and a half almost two years mm -hmm. we, need, we need continuity there i think it's really important um when it's you have consistent leadership over time when you're when you're changing um whether it's coaches or you know with your athletic director every time you change it you kind of hit a pause and, and you take unfortunately when you pause you're going backward because everybody else yeah. is going forward um so i think with consistency there and the investment in football um i think all those things are going to help yeah then we got to keep our players and yeah. now like i said our guys now are going to be seniors We've got great senior leadership. We didn't have any starters going the portal. We've added some additions. Mm. Now we got to go out and now we got to go out and put it all together, and yeah. we got to win some games that people don't think we can. Yeah. I mean, we battled Clemson hard twice. We almost yeah. beat them in Death Valley twice. We dropped the snap going in with 12 seconds left, mm. down four, and we were up 28-10 my first year in COVID, where we were like 35. We got to we got to win one of those. Yeah. Um, and then I think that will continue to generate excitement and build off the momentum that we left beating uh, SMU, who no one thought we were going to beat. Yeah, and they had a great season. We need to build off of that and continue that. And I think it combined with the leadership, the consistency in coaching and keeping your players, yeah. I think a place like this has a chance to go on a really good run. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's what's exciting about this school. The, the most exciting piece is, though, you're dealing with great kids. And if you had yeah. a chance, and, and hopefully you can come back and watch practice, We've got great guys and yeah. they do the right things on and off the field. Um, and they're fun to be around yeah. and hopefully that we're doing things for them that they can look back and say that I helped change their life. Cause yeah. hopefully that's why I came back. Yeah. Uh, I love to ask this question. Um, <clears throat> what's the best advice you've ever received in your career? Uh, that's a good one. Um, probably be yourself and don't try to be anyone else because mm -hmm. eventually they'll figure it out. <laughs> Um, and be honest. I think the mm -hmm. one thing that I had a coach, um, Bob Ford, who was the head coach at Albany. And he was there for like 40 years. He's one of the best I've ever been around. And I remember as a young coach, I was sitting in his office with him. We had end of year meetings and we had a linebacker who wasn't very good. And mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, I was like 21 years old, ready to tell him what he needed to work on, how he could be a great player. And he was never going to be a good player. <laughs> and I remember coach said to him, he's like, He's like, hey, big guy, look, sometimes you dangle a carrot out in front and you say, there it is, go get it. He said, for you, there is no carrot. You're never going to get it, right, Jeff? And I just froze, like, did he just really? But he was just being honest with the kid. Yeah. And I think one of the key pieces I've learned is you got to be brutally honest. Yeah. If a guy's going to be a scout team player, when you have your exit meeting with him, 
be honest with him. Okay. Tell him that this is what he can do to get better. But realistically, you're going to be a scout team player next year. Yeah. At least when they come back, they'll respect you for it. Yeah. And there's some guys that you're going to be a backup or you're going to be the starter. And at least you do your best every day to be honest with them. Yeah. And I think when that starts to permeate around the team, I think over time, they they respect that yeah. because they know I'm just not going to tell them they had a great day when they didn't have a great day. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a balancing act with that, but I think you gotta be, you gotta be honest. Yeah. You gotta be yourself. Um, and those are keys that I've learned. And the other thing that I've learned too, from a guy I have a ton of respect for is, I mean, in my job, there's going to be really hard, hard times, right? We've had five game win streak this year. We had a three game losing streak this year. Mm -hmm. I think consistency is the key. Um, and what I found is that when things are really bad and really hard, I need to be the most positive guy in the world mm -hmm. because a guy comes in my office and he thinks the world's ending. Yeah. I need to show him my, you're still a man and you still should have a lot of confidence. Same with the staff. I got to pick them up. Yeah. But when things are going really good, then mm -hmm. I got to show the kid why he's not the man. Cause the whole world's telling him social yeah. media is telling him. So I got to be the balance balancing act. You yeah. check Twitter and everybody tells you you're the man. I got to show you why yeah. you're not doing good enough. Yeah. You know, so it's a balance, it's a balancing act for me and there has to be a consistency for me, but they got to know I love and care about them and they're going to get the truth from me. Yeah. Uh, I talk a lot on this show and in my content about adversity, you know, I've faced some of my career and everyone goes through it, right? Well, what's a time in your career, whether it's here, whether it's before you got here that you faced a moment of adversity and how'd you overcome it? You, you face adversity every day yeah. as a head coach. Um, <laughs> You know, this year we started off one and three. Mm -hmm. We lost the game to Northern Illinois week one. Yeah. And we should have won the game, right? Yeah. And then we lose to Florida State. Um, and uh, we lose to Louisville. And we get, we almost beat Florida State. And then we're starting to feel like, all right, mm -hmm. you know, we lost by a point to one of the best teams in the country. And then we go out to Louisville and, and we come out and get punched in the face and they mm -hmm. beat us up pretty good. And at that point, it's, you know, how are these guys going to respond? They mm -hmm. went through a really tough year last year. Mm -hmm. I mean, people were probably saying some really bad things about me and I get it, right? That's the nature mm -hmm. of my job. And I had to rally the team and um, we won five games in a row. And I, I think that was probably the most adversity that I've had and the team's had and the way they responded was I did just what I said I did. I didn't get in front of the team and start yelling and screaming and changing yeah. how I was. I showed them why we were losing and what we needed to do to get better and continue to give everything I had stayed consistent. Mm -hmm. Um, was honest with guys, made some changes that I need to make. Um, and we went on a five game run and that, that was hard, you yeah. know, really hard. That, that plane ride home from Louisville was tough. Yeah. I mean, watching our team, how are these guys going to respond? Am I going to get them back? And we did. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was a big learning lesson for me. And, I mean, just like anything else, you, you just got to put your head down sometimes and run through things and yeah. you're going to find adversity. Every one of us is going to find adversity at some point, yeah. whether you're in a Super Bowl one year, the next year is tough, right? Yeah. I mean, that's just life and yeah. whatever we do. Yeah. And to, to go through that early, early in the season and come out and then win those five games is, uh, when you go through adversity together, it changes things, right? It, you, it, the it, culture changes. You come closer together and you're like, damn, we can do this thing. You, you know? do. And it, yeah. you find out when you find out about yourself, mm -hmm. right? You find out about your coaches and you find out about your team. Mm -hmm. and you find out who the real guys are. Yeah. Right. And if guys can get through that together, then you feel like you got something. Yeah. Then you feel like what you're doing is going in the right direction. Yeah. And that the culture you're building is real. Yeah. Because if it wasn't, we would have completely tanked. Yeah. Especially with the tough no, no. year of the year. It would have been easy to tank, right? So we, that would have been an <laughs> yeah. easy thing to do. Point yeah. fingers. Yeah. Meet a point fingers at the players. Mm -hmm. Meet a, make coaching changes in the middle of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, meet a step in and take over certain things and um, switch positions around. But if you believe what you're doing is right and you keep giving everything you got and you keep guys together, you got a chance. Yeah. And now this group this group's got confidence. So it's going to be exciting to see what the soft season brings. Yeah. Uh, last question I got for you, coach. Appreciate all your time. It's been almost an hour now. Oh, <laughs> this has been great. Um, what's your why? What's the reason you do what, uh, do what you do every single day? The players. Yeah. Changing lives. I mean, that's, that's been everything for me. Um, I want to, 
I, when I hear a player get up on an interview and say, Coach Halfley changed my life, or write yeah. me a note that say, Coach Halfley changed my life, or get an NFL jersey sign that said, thanks for everything in this year, you've changed my life. Yeah. Like When it's all said and done for me, how many people, yeah. coaches, young coaches, players, can say that about me? Yeah. Um, that's why I do what I do. It's always what I wanted to do. I want to have an impact on people when it's all said and done for me, whether you liked me, whether you didn't like me, that I treated you the right way and I helped you later on in your life. And that's it for me. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, Coach, appreciate your time. This has yeah. been great. I appreciate you having us here. We'll, we'll try to come back this spring, but uh, it's been fun to follow your career and, and get to know you a little bit today. So we're, we're certainly rooting for you guys this uh, this coming season. I appreciate it. Thank you guys for having appreciate me on. This is awesome. Yeah. Appreciate it, man. It wasn't, it wasn't too bad, right? No, it was great. <laughs>